Hello and good evening uh, to this uh, new class and new lecture on Einstein's general theory of relativity. So we would continue that what we left yesterday. Uh, we almost covered all the aspects of uh, uh, the Einstein's field equation, which is basically what we are targeting to. And uh, today we will just look into one thing which is left over, which is called the stress energy momentum tensor. Now, let us remember one thing that when we are dealing with uh, the left hand side and right hand side of the equation, and we know that the curvature is being measured by the uh, left hand side, and then we measure the presence of matter and how much the matter is causing the curvature, that is what is on the right hand side. I mean to say the stress energy momentum tensor. How the stress energy momentum tensor is also coupled by uh, certain other things, that is the 8 pi g uh, divided by. C4 and all those stuff. So we will come to that one by one. But first, let us cover up what is the uh, stress energy momentum tensor. For that, I would like to first show the jam board, which uh, we actually was trying to explain things over there. So let me just uh, cover up this part in a fresh uh, set of, uh, I would say, page where I can take things and say, let us take away this thing and would like to put it over here. Uh, just a second, I will just copy this part and I will take it over here. Okay, so uh, we are actually dealing with this one, this, this part. This is a stress energy momentum tensor, which actually shows the presence, or I would say it is a measurement tool to know how much stress is being caused so this part of it is basically all those curvature, and this one would be the stress energy momentum tensor. So uh, this is actually a tensor component. So let me write it again. It is a tensor component. I would say, let, let us put it as a four by four tensor component so that the, the indices are basically from uh, length, breadth, height, and time. So this is a four by four tensor component. So you see this one is also a four by four tensor component, all of them. Uh, even this one is a four by four tensor component. And this one also is a four by four tensor component. And two of the metric tensors act, uh, which happens over here. So uh, as I was uh, you know, telling you that this is a set of 16 partial nonlinear differential equations. So these are the stress energy momentum tensor that covers up those. So we go back to the slide, I mean to say, where we are actually left with, uh, so that it becomes convenient for you to see. And we'll keep the Jamboard on. And uh, I will directly come to, these are the things which are covered, so we're not going into that. So metric tensor is being covered, uh, symmetric nature is being covered, Ricci curvature, and then we straight away move to what is called the Riemann curvature tensor is also being covered and we move to the stress energy momentum tensor. Yeah. So here you can see this is how the stress energy momentum tensor looks like. Now, one thing we should be aware that whenever we are talking about the stress energy momentum tensor, it actually is the matter. So when we are talking about matter, that means that everything related to the matter, that means not only stress, it can be energy, it can be energy density, it can be, say, for example, momentum, it can be momentum density, all of these things will be taken together. Most importantly, we should remember that all those things are basically what we call in terms of four vector, because we cannot deal with three vectors, because we have moved from the three dimension to four dimensional space time. So now there might be a question that why we are talking specifically about momentum density and the momentum, because remember, we are dealing with field equations. That means all those things are quite spread over. And uh, this spreading would not allow us to quantify each and every space. Rather, it would take a kind of a density uh, of that particular area, and then we can find out. So here you can see that the first component, T00, is basically uh, what is called the energy density. Then we take the momentum density, which is this T, T0 to T30. Then we have momentum density right on the top, and then we have got the shear stress and momentum flux pressure and so on. And because this energy density, I would say the T00 part is 
the red one. That means it actually carries and is coupled with uh, what is called the speed of light. So that is why you see that is why it is uh, um, uh, it is marked as red. Okay. So remember that stress energy tensor is actually as a tensor. I mean, is a tensor physical quality that what it describes the density and flux of energy and momentum in space. That means it is a, uh, if, if you talk of the stress tensor in Newtonian physics, it would be just the generalization of the stress tensor uh, into that area. So what it contains is the matter, the radiation, uh, the non-gravitational force fields, everything. So uh, the components, as you can see over here, is T00, T01, 02, etc. So mu nu are basically the value of the indices that it takes through. Okay, I will try to explain this on a Jamboard so that it will be easier because I don't have a space. I, I think I have to take a new kind of a Jamboard. So let me just clear things over here. Uh, okay, so. So what I will do is that I will take this over here, the stress energy momentum tensor, and say uh, let me take this one and let me put it over here so that things become easier and it becomes easy to explain also. Yeah. So we're trying to make it a little bit bigger so that it is visible to you. I will remove this. And I will uh, add the I'm so sorry. Present. I will take this one. So this becomes better. So we get this stress energy momentum tensor, momentum tensor over here. I will put right here. So here you can see what the factor is that this one, this particular part. I'm so sorry, I have to put it in this. One. This particular part, this T mu nu, sometimes it is also known as T alpha beta, whatever. Uh, this is uh, the stress energy is of tensor of order two. So let us remember tensor of order two. This one because it carries two indices. So this is of tensor of order two, and the indices. This one takes the value of zero one to two or zero one two three. That means what I can say is that this particular one it carries the value of 0, 1, 2, 3. So these are the values. I mean to say that this is exactly the value that uh, the mu nu, uh, I would say, uh, the indices that they take. So first of all, you see that the time time component, which one is the time time component? I will use this one and make it with this one, T00. So I can put it over here, right? T zero zero and this is what this is called the time 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 component so this is what is called the time time component so the time time component is the basically what we call it is it is the density of the relativistic mass that means it is basically what is called the en energy density divided by the speed of light squared so while being in the uh, I would say co-moving frame of reference, it is a direct physical in, uh, interpretation. That means this is what it is, the energy density. So I will put it as time time component is the energy density. <coughs> is the energy density. Now because it is the energy density and it is coupled by the speed of light, so that is why it comes right at the first and it is colored as red because it is, it is the highest energy density, right? And that is why it is uh, divided by the square of the speed of light, this is C square. 
Now, if you take a kind of a, uh, so suppose let us imagine this to be a perfect fluid, then the component, this one, T00, this one, uh, how we can write it? Then we can write this one as, say, for example, T00 would be equals to what? Rho. This would be equal to rho. This would be equal to rho. Why? Because rho is basically the relativistic mass per unit volume. Rho is the relative. So let me put it over here. This one is the relativistic mass per unit volume. Which one? This rho. In case of a perfect fluid, if you're taking it in case of a perfect fluid, then this rho would be nothing but the relativistic mass per unit volume. So it is the time term component energy density divided by C square. In case of a perfect fluid, what we see is that this T00 would be equal to, I'm so sorry, this should be not here. It would be at the top because these are co and contravariant components. So we should not mix it with this. I think this is fine. Yeah. T00, right. So T00 would be in case it would be, uh, uh, I would say, perfect fluid, it would result into energy density. Now, uh, if I take, uh, say, for example, the components, other components, say, for example, if I, if I consider uh, the density to be kth component of the component, then it would be T0k, if I consider this as the kth component, right? Then it would be T, I will put it over here, 0k, it is 0, right? It is not ok. So it would be T0k, which would be equal to what? Tk0, obviously, because both of them are very symmetric in nature, right? So T0k and k0 would be the same. So uh, what we get from here, now let us go back to the slide, that the it is the, it is the energy that is responsible, as we understand, uh, for the space-time curvature. That means uh, whatever energy that we see there, is basically responsible for space-time curvature. I have shown you actually the grid on the right-hand side uh, where it shows the entire matrix. So you see the energy density, then you see the energy flux, and then there is energy uh, pressure and movement of matter because it causes uh, energy or to transport from one place to another. So this flow of energy, this flow of energy uh, causes the energy flux, which causes the curvature also. And here you can see that energy plus momentum plus pressure plus stress together uh, takes up what is called the stress energy momentum tensor. And uh, uh, together they actually is responsible for what is called the uh, stress energy momentum tensor. Although there are several other mathematical implications involved in this stress energy momentum tensor. I mean to say it is not that what I am showing. This is just a kind of a snapshot and a very... Uh, brief idea of what actually things are there. So uh, I would come to the mathematics class also uh, later, but let us first understand what overall is this uh, related to, because once you go to the mathematics, that becomes a little bit complex. So now here you can see that if I take a geodesic or a straight line, okay, which actually, you know, kind of an generalization of the straight line into a kind of a curve. And from here, we consider that the matter is moving into the curve. Then this curve would actually take what is called the, uh, 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 the geodesics. And this would be, you know, responsible for causing uh, gravity, uh, gravity. So it's a manifestation. So what is actually responsible for taking up this one? I would say matter. What would be responsible for cr creating the uh, matter over there. So that is what is called the uh, stress energy momentum sensor. So an object moves through space time in a straight line, which is a geodesic. But if the space time is curved, uh, I mean to say gravity is present, then the line will follow the curvature and may change the direction. Like if you're moving through a sphere, etc. And this effect is what is known as gravity. Now, if I go back to this, uh, uh, I would say uh, equation, I, uh, the 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 the, uh, the Einstein field equation. I'll just just let let me take over this Einstein field equation once, and once I put over here, things will become much clearer. So let me take the Einstein field equation uh, clearly. 
and now you will understand what I'm trying to summarize over here. So here you see that we have uh, covered almost all the components. We have covered the Ricci curvature tensor. We have covered what is a mu nu. We have covered also the Ricci scalar. We have again covered the metric tensor, which occurs year and year. We have also covered what is known as the cosmological constant, which Einstein considered to be his greatest blunder. But however, we will talk more about the expanding universe later. We have also covered what is called the T, the stress energy momentum tensor, which causes the curvature and mu nu. So be it a kind of an any surface over here. And if we consider, I would say, any kind of a matter, any kind of a matter which is present over here, this matter is causing, causing momentum, density, stress, etc. So let us take it this as matter. So let us take this as matter. So if this is a kind of an any kind of any form of matter, let us not define, let us consider to be any form of matter, whatever mass, energy, density, etc. it has got. I mean to say this matter has got, should come over here a little bit, right? And this matter, this the energy density, momentum, flux, etc. everything is being measured by this component, that is T, the energy momentum tensor. And because it is measuring it, it surely has to have a dimension, which is mu nu. And this kind of a curvature, which you can see, this curvature, this curvature is determined with this one, as well as this one, as well as this one, in different, uh, in different ways and shapes, uh, both of them. So for the curvature part, we need three uh, tensors, the Ricci, the, uh, the, uh, the Ricci scalar, the uh, Ricci curvature tensor, the metric tensor, another which is hidden, which is the Riemann curvature tensor. But for the presence of matter, everything happens in one T, that is stress energy momentum tensor, coupled by all those constants. Now, from here, what we see is that this actually causes the deflection of starlight due to the presence of mass. So here you see, if I shine a photon without the presence of any mass, it would go straight, hit over there, and nothing is going to happen. It will, it will go in a straight line. But this is, again, a very common question, which most of the students, they discuss that uh, photons have no mass, but they, they have a momentum. But if it doesn't have a mass, how does it affect gravity? The question is that it really doesn't have uh, affect the gravity. It actually follows the geodesics, but it is the presence of the sun, you see, that causes a kind of a curvature. And the photons, they travel and take the path, which is either a straight line or a curvature. So this actually led to the concept of the black holes that if the mass is too much, I mean to say it tears apart the fabric of space time, not literally tear apart, but the curvature becomes infinite. And that is why it creates a kind of a black hole. Although black holes, if you talk, talk of the, uh, you know, evolution through stars, that is how a dying star, uh, you know, uh, collapses and forms a singularity or a black hole. That is from the astronomical part. Or from a mathematical point of view, even if the star, you know, basically uh, dies, it will create a black hole because its curvature would be infinite. I have a separate video which explains how a star dies, collapses in its own. So there is one. One is an implode and an explode. So uh, the star undergoes basically an implode. And this was first calculated by... Uh, Carl Schwarzschild, who developed the first, uh, I would say, um, exact solutions of Einstein's field equation, that is called a critical radius, a Schwarzschild radius, and anything, um, my body, this microbe, this room, this earth, anything can be turned into a black hole if we can squeeze it below the Schwarzschild radius. So this is what the Schwarzschild radius looks like. So if the Schwarzschild becomes r equals to zero, then it is called a space-time singularity, but the gravity is so instant that the space-time actually breaks down. And if r becomes equals to rs, that means the radius approaching becomes equal to the Schwarzschild radius. This is called a coordinate singularity. So this, uh, you know, picture uh, describes the black holes. So you can see each time from the sun to white dwarf to neutron star to a black hole, what has happened is that those red lines denote that the gravity or the uh, what I would say, the curvature has increased each and every time. So that is why if I take time as a kind of a, a separate coordinate, 
although it is a space time so you see that it takes more time because of the curvature that you travel down and that is why uh, you know it it appears that time slows down so here is a nice diagram which shows that if i start from 9 am and i am going through a schwarzschild black hole radius i will uh, later explain you what is schwarzschild radius because it is a symmetrical non chargeable uh, you know non rotating black hole because this will make equations rather easier i would reach at 3 o'clock on the other side of the uh, black hole or other side of the curvature whereas if i start at 9 am then on earth because the earth's uh, i would say curvature is less i might reach uh, reach on the other hand by 11 o'clock so what happens here is that a person near a black hole which age slower Uh, compared to that someone far away from black hole because passing of the time is slowed down due to extremely strong gravitational force so when we talk about time dilation which we means is slowing down the passing of the time can fundamentally only be observed uh, by uh, by things changing therefore so you you being a near a black hole that is a strong gravitational field you would age and this actually shows the gravitational redshift because the strong gravitational redshift pulls the photon and thereby loses its energy it really doesn't loses its energy it is again established to noether's theorem that the energy is being maintained that is the law of conservation of energy is intact we'll come to that later so the loss of energy results in a longer wavelength which is a redshift and again there is something reverse which is called a blue shift so the person standing on the other end of the black hole will always see that the person is going and going forever although that person has already crushed through the event horizon and has been doomed to death inside the black hole because it takes a huge time of a long wavelength because from black hole it is so intense and from there it takes a long time to reach the eyes it will appear that the person has never reached although in his proper time in his time clock he has already reached there and this was actually first proved by these two Uh, nobel laureates reinhard genzel andrea gez and another the very renowned person our dear old dr roger penrose so dr roger penrose uh, singularity and what he tried to prove through gravity i mean to say what he what is showed roger penrose is that uh, through a geometrical approach of uh, you know singularity that you really uh, the gravitational collapse is inevitable if there is a, a kind of a black hole Uh, it it was showed earlier by uh, einstein's field equations but later what happened is that those equations became so difficult mathematically to find out a type kind of a typical uh, situation so he used uh, i will tell you later roger penrose contributions is immense phenomena he used geometry to describe that so uh, roger penrose calculations followed by reinhard genzel and andrea gez observation that is uh, he they found out what is called a supermassive black hole and here is the kind of a, a photograph which shows you see the supermassive black hole when the star s2 is far off i mean it's a distance from the black hole uh, the the color is a kind of a whitish color you see that is blue because it has not undergone a redshift so from here it is a distance from the observer so as it comes closer and closer and closer and on may 19th 2018 it made, made the closest orbit around the supermassive black hole the redshift happens so far away the redshift is not happening in india so near when it comes it makes a kind of a redshift which actually proves the it proves actually lot of things it again proves general relativity is correct it proves there is a gravitational redshift it proves that there is a supermassive black hole and it also proves that this presence of curvature actually creates a kind of a gravitational time dilation and that is why we see that the color of the star is red and it takes a long time for the eye to reach and understand that how how longer the wavelengths are and it is for this purpose that uh, they won the nobel prize in physics along with roger penrose andrea gez and reinhard genzel so that's all for today's uh, you know lectures i have given a overall idea but i know there are a lot of hazy areas a lot of gray areas things are not quite okay with metric tensor stress energy what are those uh, you know indices what do they mean how do they relate to the einstein field equation what is the mathematics behind that 
that is the objective of this channel to explore more and more about general theory of relativity so i will carry on with the mathematics and starting ahead with new i'm also thinking of making some videos instead of also coming to lectures lectures will be on videos will also be on so hopefully i will be back on monday that is the 4th of december and uh, those who are watching me overseas as well as in india uh, 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 i would like to wish you a uh, Merry Christmas and uh, season's greetings. A little bit ahead, I know that Christmas is still, you know, coming. But I hope that you enjoy the Christmas and your, uh, you know, holidays, winter holidays specifically, with your family, as well as you keep on watching this channel and keep on learning physics and mathematics. I will be back on Monday around same time with some new uh, ideas on general theory of relativity. This actually covers the overall idea of Einstein's field equations, the components, how they are related. But we have a huge way to go. And that is the plan. That is what we are going. On my other channel, Physics for Students, tomorrow, Dr. Sudeshna Ganguly, uh, she is an, a scientist at Fermilab, would be coming down at 8 o'clock Indian Standard Time, GMT plus 5.30 hours. If you want, you can watch her talking about particle physics, muons, her experiences. And if you really want to know more about particle physics, I think that would be a wonderful experience. Physics for students, you can find that on my uh, this channel also, 8 p.m. Indian Standard Time uh, with Dr. Ganguly, learning more about particle physics. And there are more surprises regarding guests coming up in this uh, month. I will slowly, uh, you know, um, reveal one by one. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please do subscribe and share this video and this channel so that we can uh, people can learn more. Thank you very much.